Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs and this is the second part of my in-depth Sony A7 Mark IV review, concentrating on the movie quality and video features. If you're looking for a deep dive into the design, controls and overall performance for stills, check out my part 1 linked here. The extra detail about the design will however be useful even if you only intend to use the camera for video, so go check that out afterwards. As for this second part, which you're watching right now, I'll show you around the A7IV's controls and features specifically for video use, followed by an in-depth look at the movie focus, resolution, noise, slow motion and rolling shutter, along with how the camera performs for vlogging and as a USB webcam, and of course, a look at whether overheating is an issue on this camera. There's absolutely loads for you in this review, and I'm not even going to stall it with any sponsorship, so if you find any of it useful, please do consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks, now let's get on with it. Ok, first things first, the A7 IV body alone costs 2500 US dollars or around 2600 pounds. Right, now for a quick look at the body features and design from a video perspective. In arguably the most requested update for videographers, the A7 IV becomes the first model in this series to sport a side hinged, fully articulated screen. Stills photographers may be in two minds over this decision, but for video, it's a win, allowing you to flip the screen forward to face you, absolutely invaluable whether you're vlogging, presenting a piece to camera, or simply setting up a webcam meeting. In fact, I know owners of previous models for which this alone will be justification to upgrade. The EVF also enjoys a boost in resolution over the Mark III to bring it in line with current mirrorless rivals like the EOS R6. This makes manual focusing easier than before, especially when coupled with some of Sony's assistants, which I'll mention in just a moment. In terms of controls, Sony's moved the record button from the viewfinder side to the top surface, but more importantly, now employs a new collar control around the mode dial to switch between stills, movies, and the S&Q mode. By default, each mode shares the same exposure settings, but delve into the customization in the setup menus and you'll find options to enable separate settings for stills and movies, which saves lots of time for anyone who regularly switches between them. Do note though that if you push the movie record button during stills mode, the video will inherit those still settings. As for memory, the A7 IV is equipped with dual SD card slots, both able to exploit UHS-2 cards and write stills or video to both simultaneously if desired. Slot 1 can alternatively use a faster CF Express card, but thankfully none of the video modes actually require the extra speed of CF Express, so it only really benefits the speed and buffer during photo bursts, and I've gone into more detail about that in part 1 of my review. The 3.5mm microphone input is positioned behind its own flap which clears the screen mechanism, while the multi-interface shoe also supports Sony's digital audio accessories. There's also a 3.5mm headphone jack and twin USB ports, with the upper USB-C port allowing charging, power delivery, tethering, and, new to the A7 IV, streaming as a standard USB webcam without any extra software or capture devices. Ok, so you're watching a YouTube live stream that I pre-recorded with the Sony A7 Mark IV, fitted with the 70-200mm 2.8 G Master Mark II lens, of course at 200mm 2.8, because if you really want to show off on those work conference calls, this is the kind of setup that you're going to need to get that really nice, genuine shallow depth of field background without resorting to those dirty digital filter effects. We don't want any of those here, do we? And of course, because I am filming with a decent quality camera with an excellent autofocus system, I can stride towards to make my point or go back again, change my position on the frame and know that that autofocus system is going to keep up with me. But of course, this is something that you've been able to achieve with large sensor cameras and bright aperture lenses for ages. You just capture their HDMI output with separate hardware and software like OBS. Or if you're really lucky, maybe your camera already comes with a webcam driver but the A7 Mark IV makes it that bit easier by presenting itself just as a standard webcam. As soon as you plug a USB cable into it, it says, do you want to use me as a webcam? And if you click OK, then that's what it becomes. And when I fired up the YouTube Live interface, it recognized the camera as quickly and easily as it did the built-in webcam on the laptop itself. So very, very simple to use. However, if you want the best quality from it, you will need to be using the USB-C output on the camera with a decent quality cable. If you do, you'll be able to achieve resolutions of 1080p up to 60 frames per second, which is what I'm streaming at now, although I am in my garden on Wi-Fi, so the quality may vary, but I've got to fix for that in just a moment, or 4K up to 15 frames per second. If, however, you use a cheaper or lower quality, say, charging cable, or if you use the micro USB port instead, then the streaming will be limited to 720 at 30p, 
But again, it is still working as a standard webcam, so it'll work on laptops or other devices, including compatible smartphones. What makes it that bit more practical, though, is that you can also record a high quality video file internally simultaneously. So I'm going to switch to that now. So now you're watching the recording that I made in the camera at the same time that I did my live presentation. And that is being recorded in 4K at 25p. You can choose whatever quality setting you want. It won't support 10 bit, this is only in 8 bit, but it does look and sound so much better than the streaming version. And of course, it's not limited or restricted to your internet connection or any dropouts that you might have experienced. And that makes it really useful because it means that you can reuse that presentation in a separate project, a higher quality project afterwards. So by allowing itself to be used as a high quality webcam, well, it's another string in the bow of the A7 Mark IV. The lower micro USB port can also be used for streaming up to 720p or tethering while the upper one is handling power. But sadly, this micro USB port can no longer be used for power delivery or charging, which makes it a lot less useful than before. But in a very welcome upgrade over its predecessor and Canon's mirrorless cameras, the HDMI port now features a full-size Type-A connector. Much appreciated, Sony, thanks. Although there's currently no word as to whether it will ever output raw video. I have a feeling Sony may reserve that as a feature for the A7S upwards. As you'd expect, the A7 IV is powered by the same NP FZ100 as the A7 III and all current models in the Alpha series. It remains one of the best around, and I was able to charge it in camera using my MacBook Pro or Galaxy S20 chargers, although again, sadly, no longer with the micro USB port. Sony says it's improved heat dissipation over the A7 III, and it's certainly slightly thicker all around than its predecessor, although thankfully only a few grams heavier. The grip's larger too, and personally speaking, I found it more comfortable to hold and use. So how long can you record for? Like recent Sony cameras, the a7 IV dispenses with that annoying half-hour limit per clip that was imposed on the old a7 III and still plagues the EOS R5 6 But the maximum clip time is influenced by the auto power off temp setting. At the default standard setting, the a7 IV overheated and shut down in my tests after about 35 minutes worth of 4K, and at any frame or bitrate, that didn't seem to make a difference, although the camera itself didn't feel that warm afterwards. Set the auto power off to high though, and it happily kept recording in my tests until I either ran out of battery or memory. So how long can you record for on the A7 IV before either overheating or battery becomes an issue? Well, in this test, the battery has. I started off fully charged, and as you can see, I've now got the low power warning icon in the corner, so this battery's gonna run out any second now. And I've managed to record just over two hours, two hours and six minutes of 4K footage at 25p with continuous autofocus, and that's in IPB 100 megabit 4208 bit. And if I hold the side of the camera, it's a little bit warm, but certainly not hot to the touch. In the end, I managed to record a single 4K 25p XAVCS clip lasting two hours, eight minutes and 53 seconds on the full charge before the battery ran out without any overheating issues. I also tried 4K at 50p in 10 bit using XAVC HS at 200 megabits per second to really try and tax the camera, and I squeezed almost 1 hour and 18 minutes onto a 128 gigabyte SD card before I ran out of memory, and again without any overheating issues. Now, of course, your mileage will vary depending on the ambient temperature, but already this is a major advantage the A7 IV has over both the A7 III and Canon's EOS R5 and R6, all of which are limited to half-hour clips. Plus, the R5 and R6 infamously face overheating and cooldown issues in any of their headline modes. Okay, next for autofocus, and you're looking at the A7 IV filming 4K 25p with the FE 70-200 2.8GM2 at 70mm 2.8 and pulling focus between the two bottles effortlessly using a single AF area. This also works well using the touchscreen to select the desired subject. Here's the same lens at 70mm 2.8, but this time with a human target, where again the camera has no problem keeping me sharp throughout without any hunting. You can also adjust the transition speed and sensitivity. The A7 IV now also supports eye tracking during video recording for human subjects as well as animals and birds. So here's Steven Siegel with the same lens but the camera autofocus system switched to bird eye detection where again the technology just gets out of the way and does what you want it to. Eye tracking even works when filming birds in flight. You just need to remember to select between human, animal or bird in the menus for the best results. If you prefer to focus manually, the A7 IV offers a variety of assistance, including magnification prior to filming and peaking in the choice of colours while filming if desired. 
But new to the A74 is the focus map feature, which attempts to visualize the actual depth of field with the clear areas indicating what's actually in focus, while anything behind is colored blue and anything in front is colored red. To demonstrate it in action, I recorded the view when fitted with the 70 to 202.8 at 202.8 this time, and manually focusing between the jar, which is closest to me, and the two bottles behind it. Again, when you can see the subject in normal color, it's within the depth of field, it's in focus. As I close the aperture down, notice how the depth of field increases with the clear areas expanding as you'd expect. Now at first the focus map looks too blocky to be really useful, but over time I found it a surprisingly accurate way of visualizing depth of field and a fun alternative to focus peaking, both for setting up a shot and while filming. Okay, next for a video where I'm manually pulling focus from the nearby subject to the garden in the background and back again with the FE 20mm 1.8, an excellent lens, but one which suffers from quite noticeable breathing as you can see. This is where the field of view changes as you vary the focus and it can be quite distracting for videographers. New to the a7 IV though is focus breathing compensation which automatically crops and rescales the image in real time as you focus for selected lenses including the 20mm. So here it is in practice where the magnification change seen previously has essentially gone. Now of course the entire clip needs to be cropped to the narrowest field of view, effectively the worst case scenario for that lens's particular focusing range, but the amazing part is just how well the camera is scaling the image in real time, even as I randomly adjust the focus back and forth. Here's both clips side by side with the normal one on the left and the one with compensation applied on the right. Again note the crop to the field of view on the right, but it may be a sacrifice worth making if you're performing a dramatic focus pull and want zero breathing. The feature works on all the G-Master lenses up to the 70 to 200, as well as the 21.8, 12-24 f4, 24-105 f4, and the 28-135 f4. Okay, now it's time to see what quality modes are available. You can record 1080 video at 24 to 120p, or 4K at 24 to 30p, all without a crop, and oversampled from 7K's worth of data. 4K is now also available at 50 and 60p, but only in the cropped Super 35 format with a 1.5 times field reduction. You can also film 1080 at 24 to 120p and 4K at 24 to 30p in the Super 35 format, and all cropped footage is oversampled from 4.6K's worth of data. So the A7 IV avoids the Mark III's crop at 4K 30p, it adds 4K at 50 or 60p, it oversamples for more data, but it sticks with a maximum slow motion rate of 1080 at 120p. In another important upgrade over the a7 III though, you can now record any mode in 8 or 10 bit with 422 options for everything other than 1080 at 100 or 120p. The XAVCS HD and XAVCS 4K modes of the earlier a7 III are also now complemented by the more efficient XAVC HS 4K mode that employs H.265 encoding, so make sure you've got a nice fast computer if you're going to be using that, as well as XAVCSI in 1080 or 4K for all intra encoding at bit rates up to 600 megabits per second. Right, that's enough numbers, so let's have a look at some actual footage, all filmed with the A7 IV with the FE 70 200 2.8 G Master 2 at 70mm f11, starting with 1080 at 50p. Now, in order to see the best quality from the lens and the camera, I filmed all of these without an ND filter, so that means that I've had to use quite a fast shutter speed, so apologies for the choppy playback. It was also pretty windy, so sorry if there's any wobbles. And next for 1080 at 100p, which is also uncropped. Now, I've started to play this clip to you at the normal playback speed, but I've now slowed it by four times on my 25p timeline. I like that Sony still doesn't slow the footage in camera unless you're in S and Q mode. And for comparison, back to normal 1080 at 50p before moving on to 4K at 25p, which is also uncropped up to 30p and oversampled from 7K's worth of data. A nice upgrade over the a7 III, which applied a minor crop at 30p. Also note Canon's R5 and R6 also apply a small crop to all 4K that's recorded in the 16x9 UHD shape. And now for 4K at 50p, which as you can see applies a 1.5 times crop and which oversamples from 4.6K. You can also apply the Super 35 crop to 1080 or 4K at any frame rate, so here's 4K at 25p in the Super 35 mode. And now back to 4K 25p uncropped for a moment, and like all my previous clips, this was filmed using the standard creative look and with picture profiles set to off. 
So let's first switch that now for S Cinetone, which provides an attractive result out of camera without any adjustment. And next for Hybrid Log Gamma, or HLG for short, and this again is out of camera without any additional tweaking or grading. Now if you are really into grading, there's S-Log2 and S-Log3 available in the picture profiles, and this is S-Log3 from Picture Profile 9 straight out of camera filmed in 10-bit at the base sensitivity of 800 ISO. And now for a graded version where I've applied the S-Log3 LUT in Final Cut and tweaked the levels a bit. As I mentioned earlier, there's no news of raw output yet, although I suspect the A7 IV won't be getting it, so 10-bit 422 is as good as it gets, at least for now. To better reveal the differences in quality between the A7IV's modes and compare it against the Mark III and R6, I filmed my standard resolution chart in a variety of modes and fitted each camera with the same adapted Sigma 40mm 1.4 art lens at f8. I'm going to zoom in by 6 times here to more easily reveal any differences between the cameras, starting with full frame 1080-25p footage filmed with the R6 at the bottom, the A7 III in the middle, and the A7 IV at the top. Here I'd say the R6 and A7 III are roughly neck and neck, but that the A7 IV enjoys a small boost in resolution over the two of them, so that's a nice bonus if you're into filming 1080. Next for 4K at 25p, with the R6 at the bottom adjusted to accommodate its small crop, while the A7 III in the middle and A7 IV at the top are both full frame. Now it's hard to call this one on resolution alone, with all three looking similar on actual detail, although both Sonys are suffering from false colour moire artefacts in this particular test, which the R6, interestingly, is avoiding. The A7 IV may be fractionally better than the 3, but it's very close here. Next for 4K at 50p between the R6 at the bottom, which incurs a small crop, and the A7 IV at the top, which incurs a 15 times crop. Again, the Sony is exhibiting undesirable colour artefacts here at the limiting resolution that the Canon is avoiding, but in terms of actual resolve detail, they're pretty similar. And finally, another close-up comparison, this time of 1080 video, but at 100p, with the A7 III at the bottom and the A7 IV at the top. Sorry, I don't have a 100p chart result for the R6. Here, the A7 IV maintains essentially the same resolution at 100p as it does at 25, whereas the A7 III falls in quality when you set it to 100p, so that's another nice upgrade for the slow motion fans. Now, if you're worried about that false colour, do remember that I presented these results at 600% to get a really, really close look. Now, you're currently looking at that resolution chart filmed with the A7 IV in 4K at 25p, and now at 4K, 50p, and this is the actual size on the frame. So this is what you'd be getting in practice. So you decide whether it's going to be an issue or not. Next for noise comparison between the three cameras from 1600 ISO to their maximum sensitivities. That's 25,600 ISO for the R6 and 102,400 ISO for the two Sonys. This time I'm going to show them at normal magnification, as this is how you'll see them in practice. And I'm going to start with a 1080-25p comparison, followed by a 4K-25p comparison. Note the small crop from the R6 in 4K. Right, I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, next for slow motion, which in terms of specification remains similar to the A7 III, so that's 1080 at a maximum of 120p, although as you saw earlier, the quality is a little better than the A7 III, and there's also now cropped 4K up to 60p for very mild slowdowns. As before though, Sony remains one of the only companies to record high frame rate video with sound, and encode it for normal playback speed too, allowing you to drop it into a standard timeline and use it with the audio as normal, before then speed ramping it down or up again as desired. Unsurprisingly, there's no 4K 120 at this price point, at least for a full frame camera, leaving that capability to either models with smaller sensors, like the upcoming Lumix GH6, or pricier options like the A7S III, Alpha 1 or EOS R5. Like all recent Sony full framers, the a7 IV has sensor shift stabilization, or IBIS for short, that works with any lens you attach. 
New to the A7 IV though is the enhanced active mode that applies extra digital stabilization on top of IBIS with a mild crop, as well as the recording of metadata to allow post stabilization in Sony's Catalyst application. Note Active SteadyShot and Metadata are not available when recording 1080 at 100 or 120p, but they are available for everything else, so for 1080 or 4K up to 60p. Time for a quick vlog test, methinks. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs with a quick vlogging test using the Sony A7 Mark IV. And before I go into any details, I'm filming this without any stabilization at all. So the first thing I'm going to do is switch that on. Right now I've enabled sensor shift IBIS stabilization only so I can relax now and give you some more details about what I'm doing here. So I'm filming this with the Sony A7 Mark IV using the FE 20mm f1.8 prime lens which is perfect for this sort of thing. But new to the A7 Mark IV over its predecessor is active stabilization. So let's switch that on and see how much that improves things. Okay, so now you're looking at active stabilization in action. And this uses sensor shift where available, which it is in this camera, with additional digital stabilization. And like all digital stabilizers, that comes at the cost of a crop to the field of view. So it is tighter on me, but hopefully the 20 mm lens is still wide enough. But there's more. We can also apply gyro data after the event using the Catalyst software. OK, so for this clip, I've turned stabilization off and I'm first of all going to show you the version with nothing else done to it. So this is straight out of the camera and I'm using a faster shutter speed because that's what Catalyst really likes working with. So I'm at 500th of a second, which in this shady forest means that I'm also operating at a much higher ISO, 1000 ISO. So the quality isn't gonna look as good. So this section uses the same settings as before, but I've stabilized it after the event in Catalyst. Now, because I'm filming this, I can't see how well it's gonna work, which is the big gamble that you take when doing post stabilization, but hopefully you'll see that it looks pretty good. Oh, I meant to say all of the audio that I've captured here was using the built-in mics. How did they sound? And one of the lesser noted but important changes on the A7 IV compared to the three is that the strap lugs are now quite stiff in their position. So they don't rattle anymore. And that's really important if you're walking around with a camera, especially if you're using the internal mics. So that could alone be quite an important upgrade. I know that on some cameras with rattly strap lugs, I've had to use blue tack to stop them wobbling around. Anyway, that really is the end of this clip. So uh, on with the rest of the review. And here's one more comparison showing cropped views of IBIS alone on the left, active steady shot in the middle, and post stabilization using Catalyst again at 90% on the right. All were filmed in 4K 25p with the FE 20 mm lens. And finally, a rolling shutter test, starting with the a7 IV filming 1080 at 25p. Now, when I shake the camera back and forth, there is a little skewing visible, but it's not too bad here. But when I switch to 4K at 25p, the skewing becomes visibly worse, with the tower looking almost like elastic. To be fair, though, this is roughly similar to the Canon R5 and R6. Increase the frame rate to 50p, though, and the rolling shutter effect becomes reduced. Here it is at 1080 and now in 4K at 50p. So if your subject or pans are fast and you're filming in 4K, I'd use 50 or 60p to minimize the skewing. And now it's time to wrap up. For videographers, it's easy to assume the a7 IV is simply the Mark III with the addition of cropped 4K 60 and a flip out screen. And that could actually be enough for some people. But while these are the two headline upgrades, there's plenty of other less obvious enhancements to get excited about. There's now Active Steady Shot and the recording of gyro metadata for superior stabilization of handheld footage, a full size HDMI port for more robust connectivity, a more detailed viewfinder, focus mapping to better visualize depth of field, surprisingly effective compensation for focus breathing, eye detection for humans, animals, and birds, along with the ability to record long clips beyond half an hour without overheating in my test so far. It can even work as a standard USB webcam. Is that worth the $750 or so premium over a new A7 III? While the actual 4K video quality at 24 and 25p isn't exactly a leap over the A7 III, I'd say the other upgrades more than justify the price, while hybrid shooters also get to enjoy the benefits of the stills upgrades, most notably that 33 megapixel sensor. I'd also say the high resolution sensor and unlimited recording alone make it more desirable than the EOS R6 for the same money. 
Meanwhile, if you desire 4K at 120p or raw output from a full frame camera, it's another grand to reach the A7S III, but at the loss of photo resolution, or a jump of $1300 to reach the EOS R5, which throws in 8K too, albeit with all manner of clip restrictions to worry about. If you're after less skewing on full frame and all of the above, it's a further jump still to the Alpha 1 or EOS R3. If you're starting a system from scratch though and you're not that bothered about having phase detect autofocus for video, do also check out Panasonic's offerings, both the Micro Four Thirds based Lumix GH6 or the full frame Lumix S series. Both offer excellent features for the money. Summing up, three and a half years ago, the A7 Mark III became arguably the ultimate full frame all rounder for the money, a position that the A7 Mark IV is likely to inherit. For videographers, there's not much you could realistically ask for at the price, and coupled with a steadily growing collection of compelling lenses, the Alpha system has never looked stronger. The A7 IV was a camera I really enjoyed shooting with, and I'd be very happy to have it in my collection. And that, dear viewer, marks the end of part two of my A7 Mark IV review. If you've not already seen part one, please do check it out, as it includes loads more detail on design and controls, as well as a deep dive into photo quality. But if you've now watched both parts to the end, then I salute you. You're the best, I've, I've always said that. And if you find any of my tests useful, be sure you're subscribed with notifications so you don't miss any of my latest reviews. And if you'd like to help me out with my next videos, I'm always up for a coffee, or you could treat yourself to my in-camera book or some Camera Labs merchandise, and there's links for all of this in the description below, along with checking the latest prices, of course. So thanks for watching. Let me know what you think of the A7 Mark IV in the comments and I'll see you next time or in part one if you've not already seen it. Bye.